All right, let's get to some questions that's already been turned in. And uh, I, I, I looked at the uh, uh, what, at least one of the questions tonight and almost said it in here, but uh, uh, that, that's, that's, that, that is, that is, um, that is not, not where, I, where I want to start. Here, here's a question that has been turned in in times past and says, I was talking to a family member um, uh, and mentioned that, uh, that to, uh, to enter heaven, we must be baptized, upon which they replied by saying, that's not true. Take the thief on the cross uh, next to Jesus. He was saved, and he was not baptized. Everybody, that's true. Talk to somebody, what the person says, to go to heaven, you got to be baptized. And what the person says, the thief on the cross was not baptized. That's a uh, uh, that, that's, that, that, is, that is perhaps highly likely. She says, uh, then they, they went on to say, baptism is just a sign of good faith that is not required. Uh, is that true? And then it says uh, on the backside of the, of the, of the uh, card uh, that even though I can show verses that say one must be baptized, they continue to talk about the thief on the cross. All right. Great questions, and, and let, let's just talk about it. Do you know why the thief on the cross was not baptized? Uh, you, you know, you probably know the answer. If I tell you it's the same reason that Alexander Camp, uh, that, that, pardon me, that, uh, 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 <laughs> that President Lincoln never paid income taxes. I don't have, you don't have to pay income taxes because Abraham Lincoln never paid income taxes. You know why? He died before the law came in that says you must be baptized. And you've got to understand that truth. And once you put that on a, on a, uh, on a piece of paper, you put Abraham Lincoln, uh, no taxes, and then over here, uh, uh, therefore, I do not have to pay taxes. Underneath that put, uh, be baptized, uh, 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 thief not baptized, therefore I put the name of the thief, not baptized, therefore I do not have to be baptized. Baptism for the remission of sin for every person on this earth became effective when Jesus died. Look at uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 16 and 17 says, where there is a testament of necessity, there must be an individual who writes the testament. It's his, it's his last will and testament, and it is not effective until he dies. Now, is the baptism of Jesus for the remission of sins? And the person who asked the question says, I've showed my, my family members that. You know, there are those verses. And, and, and there's actually a multitude of verses that will show you must be baptized. When did that become effective? After the death of the testator. That's Jesus. And you understand that. You put, you put that in a legal requirements. Of, of your own last will and testament. You write that down in relationship to your own last will of testament. I know you've got millions of dollars that, you're, that you plan to leave to everybody, and you can say, and you can put conditions on them receiving this. I leave, you know, uh, uh, you know $100,000 to my son if he's a graduate with a 3.0 uh, GPA from a respectable college. Now then, $100,000. Is it conditional? Yes. Before you die, could you give that, give that individual $100,000? Absolutely. Unconditionally. And whenever Jesus said to that individual, today you will be with me in paradise, there's no question that the thief was saved. He's going to be with Jesus in paradise. He was saved on the cross. And there's, there's no way you could even show that, he's, that he was baptized. 
whether he'd had John's baptism or not, a sort of immaterial. He, it, universal salvation for all mankind did not become effective until Jesus died. And so instead of finding a thief on the cross before Jesus dies and say, well, uh, uh, you know, uh, you, you had another son and you say, I leave to both of my sons. Well, th that end of it, and you put the same conditions on it. But before you die, you give to one of your sons $100,000. Now, the last will and testament says, I leave to my sons $100,000 if he's graduated. Well, my brother got his ahead of time, therefore give me the $1,000. That is the exact parallel of that. And so there is that, there is that aspect of it. And I would just go to this passage and sort of just park right here and say, where is that? Is it in the New Testament or the Old Testament that one must be baptized in order to be saved? Now, we understand what Jesus said. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He says that after he's dead. He says that, you know, after he's been raised from the dead. Can there be any question that the will and testament of Jesus is that the he, well, let me ask it this way. Mark 16, 16, who is the he that shall be saved? It doesn't take a, a 3.0 GPA from a, a respectable university to answer that question. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. You know what your relative is saying? He who believes and is not baptized shall be saved. That's amazing. Now, a way to really drive this home, and you've got to be gent gent gently, gentle when you're doing this, provided, you know, you come at it with humility and they're being humble in their, in their uh, expressed desire to do what the Bible says. But in humility... I would write on a piece of paper, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Right underneath it I would write, he who believes and is not baptized shall be saved. I would hand the, pa the paper over to them and I would say to them, mark through the one you do not believe. You know the one he'll help to make. The argument has been making is that the he that shall be saved is the one who is not baptized. He'll still be saved. And whenever they take the pencil, if they're honest, whenever they mark through the one they disagree with, they've just marked through the words of Jesus. There's so many other ways to come at this, but uh, uh, the, 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 what, what you need to do is to go, but in reality, you need to take away from that individual the verses that he's using. He's using a Bible verse. But there is not one verse in the Bible that belongs to a man that's teaching that which is wrong. I want you to understand that. Every verse in the Bible belongs to those who are seeking truth. I remember as a young man in New Zealand as a missionary discussing the Bible with some Jehovah's Witnesses, just like you've tried to do, you know, have, you, you've done that, or, or uh, you know, uh, other individuals, and, and they'll make an argument. And uh, uh, you know what I always said? I believe every word of that verse. Will you give me time to study it and so we can talk about it next week? I don't know how to answer you right now. That's not your verse, that's my verse. And you need to understand that. And so in argumentation, I don't mean argumentation, I just mean in trying to teach others, every verse belongs to you. You don't, you know, if you in argumentation do this, they make an argument and then you make an argument with another verse 
They made an order about the thief on the cross, and you show verses that so show you must be baptized. You've made the Bible look like this. God teaches one thing in one place and another thing in another. Which of those verses is he going to believe? He's going to believe his verse. What you've got to do is, is when it's like this, you've got to take his verse and move it over so it is parallel to what the Bible really says. You cannot use the Bible to teach false doctrine and, 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 and keep it in the right context. And, and if you cannot answer it, if, and if there is no answer, then you need to change what you believe. That's what you expect him to do, isn't it? If there was a verse in the Bible that says, He that believes and is not baptized shall be saved, uh, and that verse was stated that emphatically, and you read it, I believe you're honest enough to say, there's something about this I don't understand. So in trying to, change, to reach the lives of others, don't present argumentation that comes out like this. Just take the verse that they have and bring it over and make the Bible parallel because if, th if this is true, then this is true because God cannot lie. God's not going to say one thing in one place and teach something different in another place. I guess that's enough time on that question, but I, uh, uh, I, I, I think it's pretty good. Here's one. Can you wear makeup? Uh, not very well. <laughs> I, know, I know the question. I, I made sort of a, made, made light of it. This person uh, uh, put, the, put their, they signed their name to this one. So uh, if you remember turning in this card some, some, some other time, I, uh, I hope you, uh, you understand I'm not, uh, that, I, that I know this person well enough to answer it in that way. There are religions that say it's wrong to wear makeup. Isn't that what Jezebel did? You remember that? That Jezebel, whenever they were coming to take her life, she put on makeup. So anybody that wears makeup is, a, is like is a Jezebel. And, and what they do is they, they go to the Bible and they find verses that, that who says, who's adorning? Let it not be. And, and so you, you look at let it not be, and it says the wearing of gold and the wearing of silver. Isn't, 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 isn't that uh, remarkable? And so they'd say, you know, you cannot wear gold. You, can, you, cannot wear, have a, you cannot have a wedding ring. I remember growing up as a kid, there were some individuals very sincere in their beliefs who, who thought that individuals uh, could not wear a wedding ring. Why? Well, don't you understand that, that, uh, that the Bible says that the adornment of a woman is not to be with gold or with silver. It then says with braided hair. Now way back there, you know, there was not a people wearing braided hair. Or in, in my childhood, not many people wear, wore braided hair. How common is that in, in, uh, in America today? Culturally, it's really, really common. So, so ha what, what, what do you do with, with Paul, Paul, when, when uh, Paul says that I do not uh, uh, allow, um, uh, well, let's, let's read the verse. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8. Here's the verse they use, and from this they say, you therefore cannot wear makeup. I desire therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with propriety, and I'm reading the, uh, uh, the New King James, and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but that which is possible from women professing godliness with good works. And they'd read that verse and say, you could not have a gold watch, you could not have a silver watch. And there are people conscientious about that. And I don't mock them. They really believe that's what this verse is saying. What is this verse saying? It says, whose adorning let it not 
be. But let it be with something else. Look at, look at the rest of it. Not with braided hair or gold or pearl or costly clothing. In that which is... Uh, 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 or costly clothing, but that which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. What does that say? Not with this, but with this. You see, there is an absence of a Jezebel wearing her gold and her silver and her makeup. And other God, and, and watch this, other godly women in the Bible who did wear gold and silver. Jezebel was adorned with this, but not with good works. That does not say that everybody who wears gold and silver is a Jezebel. Is it possible for a godly, holy woman to wear pearls? Is it possible for a godly, uh, holy woman to, to, to adorn herself with good works and wear gold and silver? So it may not be either or, it is one over here with this without good works. What's the mistake of that whose adornment, whose beauty does not come from an outward manifestation of how beautiful she is? Look at the expression, in like manner. In like manner to what? In like manner to men who adorn themselves with holy hands. Here, men lifting up holy hands, and in like manner, a woman needs to be holy. Her adornment does not need to be the one or the other. Okay? Now, look over in, in 1 Peter chapter 3. Uh, in, in, in 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, very much similar kind of language. He says in 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, starting in verse 3, I'm trying to, David, to see the screen if that's where you started. Do not let your adornment be merely outward saying the same thing. Then he says, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. You want to look at that word fine? Uh, I don't know, David, does that have translations in it? Does it have italics in it? My Bible puts the word fine in uh, in italics, saying the, that, 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 is not e that word is not even in the original language. Now, in the other one, it talks about, you know, costly apparel. But this, if, it, if costly apparel is forbidden in the other one because it says costly apparel, what about a verse that says she cannot put on any apparel? If the word fine is not there, then the Greek says she cannot, she'd have to run around naked. Well, no, 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 no. She's got to wear cold clothing. Absolutely. There's a whole bunch of verses that says that. But if you're saying because one says she cannot wear costly apparel, therefore a woman could not wear gold or silver or pearls, therefore it is sinful, then when Peter says, let her adornment be not with, and he, and he talks about similar things that are over there in the passage in, in, uh, in 1 Timothy, and he says, let it not be the putting on of apparel. Now the translators, because they understood the force of the Greek, is, 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 uh, is the thing that you readily understand too. You don't mean, you cannot see this meaning. She cannot wear clothing. But that's what it says. 
But the implication is she, who, her adornment cannot be fine apparel. And then watch what he says. Neither, uh, but, or but rather, verse 4, rather let it be the hidden person of the heart with incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God very precious. Who's adorning? Let it not be, but let it be in this fashion. But don't stop right there. Look in verse 5. David, can you get verse 5 up there on the screen? Because verse 5, and here's one of those three-letter words we talked about Sunday night, whose adornment, he says, let it be that which is in the sight of God of great price, because for in this manner, in former times, Holy women of God, who, women who trusted in God, adorn themselves. You adorn yourself like holy women of old adorn themselves. Does the Bible talk about the adornment of women of old? Have you read Proverbs 31? The fact that she makes clothing for her family and all the rest, and it's beautiful, it's luxurious clothing. Holy women of old. But you don't need to go to Proverbs 31. Look what the text says. For in this manner, in former times, holy women who trusted in God adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husband. Verse 6, like Sarah, Isn't it amazing how the Bible explains itself? You adorn yourself just exactly like Sarah adorned herself. Is there anything about gold and jewelry in relationship to the life of Sarah? Well, there's an implication of it, a great implication of it, because when Abraham is sending his trusted servant to find a wife for Isaac. Do you know what he took for that woman to wear back home? You go over here and you find a wife for Isaac. Don't want her to marry one of these Canaanite women. You go back to where we came from, back over in that land, and you find a wife. Now when you get over there, I want you to put something on her. That's implied. I want you to give her something to wear. Isn't it amazing? What they gave, what he gave to her was jewelry. Wait a minute. Abraham and Sarah, picking a wife for their son, wanted Isaac to marry a holy woman and holy women in Old Testament. Sarah and Abraham chose to send jewelry over there. So what does the Bible say? Do not let her adornment be merely. And the word merely that is here in the New King James. Do not let it only be. Do not let it be merely be, but let it be the adornment. How did holy women of old adorn themselves? With gold and jewelry and we know that from the story of Abraham selecting a wife for, for uh, Isaac and the, the clothing he gave for her to wear. And that is, it was with gold and jewelry. That's, that's interesting uh, in and of itself. Here's another question. Why is the plan of salvation not clearly laid out in one place in the New Testament? Well, I may not know the absolute answer to every that. Uh, why is any truth not laid out in one verse? Isn't that, why do you have two accounts of the qualification of an elder? They're not identical. They're parallel, but they're not 
identical. Why, don't you, why, doesn't, why did God not, when it put it in 1 Timothy 3, qualification of elders, why did He not go ahead and put the things that are added over in Titus chapter 1? Well, a part of it has to do with how we find God. You will find me when you seek for me with all of your heart. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness. It's not there impossible to find. It's not impossible to find the plan of salvation. But for one verse to do what David and I do at the end of a sermon, say, now, before we close this lesson, we want, to add, we want to show you that you must believe, you must repent, you must confess, and you must be baptized. How do you know that? Does the Bible show faith is absolutely necessary? Yeah. Is that easy to find? Yeah. What about John 3.16? Well, baptism is not in John 3, 16. Neither is repentance. So when somebody says, John 3, 16 has all the answers, does it talk about repentance? No, no, it doesn't talk about repentance. Well, how do you know repentance? Well, it's, it's mentioned somewhere else in the Bible you must repent. And all of a sudden they said, it's not a, the whole plan of salvation is not found in John 3, 16. Sure makes it simple. Sure makes it easy for an individual to say in one verse, here's the entirety of the plan of salvation. Well, does the plan of salvation include faith? Yes. Does it include repentance? Yeah, Luke 13, 3, except you repent. Acts 17, 30 and 31, that God now commands all, commands all men everywhere, all men everywhere to repent. Yeah, it, it's a... a it's absolutely, wait a minute, John, uh, Luke 13, 3 doesn't say anything about believing. If you have a right because John 3, 16 says you don't have to, uh, 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 to, uh, to, to be baptized uh, in, in John 3, 16, therefore it's not mentioned. What about when you read a verse about repentance that does not mention faith? Would it be not logically for me to say, well, if because John 3.16 does not, does not uh, teach that you must repent, neither does Luke, uh, Acts 17, 30 and 31 say that you must believe. Therefore, belief is not necessary. Man shall not live by bread alone. Matthew 4.4. 4. But... By every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. What about the matter of confession? Is confession absolutely necessary? How could confession of, of our faith in Jesus, how could it be made more emphatic than saying, if you will believe, if, if you will confess the Lord Jesus, Romans chapter 10, verse 9, you will be saved. If you confess, you will be saved. You understand that's conditional? And the fact it is conditional makes it universally applicable to, to, to every, person on, every person on this earth. But Romans 10.10 10 does not mention uh, 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 baptism. Does that mean it's not necessary? No. Romans 10.10, 10, or 10.9, I said I should use, does not mention repentance. Does that mean repentance is not necessary? No, you got to repent. You got to make up your mind you're going to follow Jesus. You got to turn your life around. Yeah, how do we know that? Why, when I read a verse about faith or about baptism, does an individual talk about John 3.16? Is the plan of salvation found in John 3.16? You know what John 3.16 says? Faith is absolutely necessary. 
You know what Acts 17, verse 30 and 31 uh, says about repentance? It's absolutely necessary. Do you know what Romans chapter 10, verse 9 says about confessing that we believe in Jesus? What does it say? If you do it, you'll be saved. But that doesn't mention faith. That doesn't mention, or doesn't specifically mention repentance. You understand? That doesn't mean it's not necessary. What about a verse? Why, when we talk about the importance of baptism, does an individual go to a Hamilton, New Zealand, and we were studying, and all of a sudden Ron turned around to me and said, Dan, and I turned to our faith, we studied back to back so we wouldn't distract each other. He said, Dan, there's not a verse about baptism in the Bible that, that does not emphatically teach it's absolutely necessary. Isn't that amazing? And Ron just, he says, I've, I've just been studying about it. Every, you find the verse in baptism. Ask them, that individual you're studying with, what, what verse would you use to show the purpose of baptism? And so uh, this individual that says, well, uh, uh, it's, well, I think the other segment on another card here parallel to this says, says that it's an outward sign. I believe I read that just a moment ago. It was an outward sign. Where does the Bible say that it's an outward sign? How would I know that it's an outward sign unless, unless the Bible taught it? Either, either uh, it emphatically stated it or, it, or it's there by implication. Is baptism an indication that I am a child of God? What verse would show that? Somebody, oh, what about the baptism of Jesus? Why was Jesus baptized? As an outward sign that he was the child of God. You know what John the Baptist did? If the purpose of baptism is to show that you, that you are a child of God, and that's what that individual affirms, look at the baptism of Jesus. When the, only, when the true, only begotten Son of God came to be baptized, a prophet sent from God refused to baptize him. Why? John, John says, I have need to be, you know, you ought to be baptizing me rather than me being baptizing you. Now, if baptism is to show that you are a child of God, then the, John should have jumped up and down and said, oh yeah, I'll baptize you because the purpose of baptism is to show that you are the child of God. But if baptism is for the remission of sins, what did John say? John says, you need to baptize me because I'm a sinner. The refusal of John to baptize Jesus shows it's not a sign, a proclamation to the world that you are a child of God. Wouldn't that be interesting? If the purpose of it was to show the world that I am the child of God, then what John the Baptist is saying, you baptize me so the world can know that I am a child, that I am the son of God. That's not the purpose of it. What's the purpose of it? In order to be saved. Except a man is born of water, that's baptism, and of the Spirit, that's the teaching of God, he'll not enter the kingdom. That's what baptism is. Baptism is in order that I might be saved, for he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Baptism is for the remission of sins. Acts 2.38, repent and, three-letter word, be baptized for the remission of sins. You know why you repent? For the remission of sins. 
That's what it says. Repent and equal conjunction and be baptized. Two things joined by, by the word that, that by its very nature is a coordinate conjunction. It makes them equal. And so he says, repent and be baptized. Why does one repent? In order to, uh, uh, in order to receive the remission of his sins. Well, for whatever reasons you repent is the very reason you ought to be baptized, and that is, that is for the remission of sin. Now, how difficult is that to find? Read the teachings of Jesus and then read the book of Acts. Did the people on Pentecost believe? It's not stated. It's implied in verse 36 when he said, let all the house of Israel know assuredly and then they cried out, we killed the Son of God. What shall we do? It's implied, but it's not stated. There's no John 3.16 in Acts 2. But if an individual is a believer, like those individuals were who were believers in Jesus, and they said, what shall we do? We believe that Jesus is the Son of God. What shall we do? What Peter did not say is, Say the sinner's prayer. Isn't that amazing? Why is the plan of salvation not found in one verse? The way it's taught by individuals is to quote John 3.16. That doesn't suit it. You know what it's practiced? Say this prayer. And on the day of Pentecost, Peter did not say... To those individuals we killed the Son of God, Peter did not just say, say this prayer and you'll be saved. And if you've just said this prayer, then you're saved and, 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 uh, and, and contact me and I'll tell you, I, I, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, uh, you know, I, I'll teach you more. The very absence of it. The power of that emphatically was uh, most emphatically shown in a situation down here uh, in, the, in the room where the elders meet, I was studying with an individual. He was, uh, he was, a, new, he was a babe in Christ. And uh, he wanted me to teach his friend. And so about the purpose of baptism. And I was saying it's for, it's for salvation. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. The friend had taken one of those posted things. You know, the little yellow posted squares? And uh, when I quoted Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized, or many brethren, what shall we do? He opened his Bible to his friend, and his friend, had, had, he had posted over that. Men and brethren, what shall we do? He had written in Acts 2.38, Say this prayer and you'll be saved. We did the same thing in Acts twenty two sixteen. 16. Why tarriest thou? Say this prayer. You know what it says? Under the post it's where he had written, you know, why tarriest thou? Say this prayer. Put a post it note. That's what he had written on that. You know what his friend did? When we went to all of these verses and the friend Lift it up to see what the right answer was. The friend says, you've convinced me. Could I be baptized right now? There's power. The Word of God is living and active. And it cuts people to the heart. And when there's an honest heart that's trying to find God... And my friend used that post-it situation to teach him. That man said, that's what I want to do to be saved. That's it for tonight. There's a Christmas box out there. Need to put some presents in that so this class can continue. Thank you very much for the way you've listened.